Today's sort of topic that I sort of picked out was product leadership and innovation. Um, looking through some of the stuff that Product School has uh, speaker covered in the past is sort of like fundamental of our product management, how you work with stakeholders, and that sort of thing. So I wanted to pick a topic that um, I, I I could draw insights from uh, based on my experience and something that I, I feel it hasn't really been covered uh, as part of the kind of Product School. Um, events in, in the past. So um, I'll, I'll share a bit about you know, my sort of interpretation of product leadership. There, there are some sort of academic uh, definition of what product management is, what product leadership is, uh, but that's quite subjective and different from company to company. Um, in, in my role at Monisa, I'm a product lead, so I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from um, how I operate um, as a product lead at Monies and previously in a kind of bigger organization contract at Barclays as well. So a little about myself, um, I sort of started my sort of product management career uh, at a Content Co, which is a Microsoft consultancy. Um, that's where I really learned to kind of build on my skills in a number of different domains and areas. So as a consultant, you're often required to quickly pick up new skills and work in a new kind of uh, field or domain area at short notice. So working across different clients and trying to pick up skills from running workshops, facilitating user research, to uh, analyzing data, to try to understand uh, what are the kind of problems uh, that customers are facing and come up with a solution with a wider team and working with engineering on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, that's where I really kind of got into grips of what product management really was and I found out um, you know, that was something that was really passionate and interesting uh, to, to kind of pursue as a long-term career. Next, I kind of moved on to American Express, um, my first sort of in-house role as a product manager. I was working as a product manager for the global digital experience, so working on improving um, <coughs> The membership experience, loyalty, uh, offers. Um, so for those that new Amex, um, you're probably quite familiar with their website or app. So uh, I was a product manager working across these experiences. Um, kind of moving forward, um, Barclays was uh, my next gig uh, where I was a senior product manager. I was looking at digital innovation, payment partnerships, uh, with the likes of PayPal, MasterCard, uh, and Amazon Payments, etc. Uh, also uh, looking at uh, push notifications, in-app notifications, uh, and a number of uh, digital communication tools that the Barclays Mobile Banking app uh, has to offer. Uh, more recently, I joined Money, so after kind of doing a stint in uh, kind of uh, banking, um, financial institutions like American Express, and also working as a consultant, um, decided that I wanted to kind of give a stab at the startup life. Um, so Money is a challenger bank. Um, you, how, many, how many people in this room um, use a challenger bank? Monzo, Starling, etc. Most people in this room, so cool, great. Um, so you guys are familiar with the concept of a challenger bank. So um, I'll quickly just kind of talk a bit, bit about Monis and what we do. So Monis, the, the way we sort of position ourselves is we are a smart and globally connected um, sort of banking alternative. So one of the things that's different is we operate in a number of different countries and, and, and we are active in over 30 countries. So we try to, for, for people who have a connection with and other countries, or whether you're, you're a student, whether you're, uh, you, you have kind of business ties or your family ties, or whether you migrated from one country to another, um, we try to be the, the bank for mobile people. So a li little bit more about us before I sort of dive into the, the crux of, of tonight. Um, so, so far, the, the sort of customer stats are 950,000 uh, customer signups, 75% of incoming funds uh, are from salary payments. Um, Last year in 20, uh, 2018, uh, we received three times uh, growth uh, and obviously a trust pilot um, 9.1 as well. So, um, yep, yeah, check them out, I guess. <laughs> cool. So, looks like we we have some people that come from product background, some people who know, uh, we have some people who aspire to move into products. So, um, what's everyone's sort of understanding and um, can someone give me give me a sort of quick one line or what they feel is, is, is a job of a of product management or a job of a product manager. Does anyone want to kind of share any of their thoughts? Being the between different people, yep. and absolutely. Yep. absolutely, yep. So I try to work with uh, different teams, engineers, designers, try to bring uh, people together to, to build something, absolutely. Anyone else got any thoughts? Yeah. I don't know the extent of this, but um, some elements of owning the vision sure. and trying to create uh, a shared vision to make sure everybody is pointing in the same direction. Sure, yep. So you, you obviously need to you know, have a clear idea and, and vision of 
where you want to take your product, um, you know, you need to sort of instill that sort of vision into your team. They need to you know, have a sort of motivation and have, have a kind of shared goal to work towards. Um, uh, you know, otherwise uh, you could be build, building something, but um, it's, it's not for the sort of greater long term vision and goal. Um, and it's not sustainable in the long term. So you need to have a clear goal from out front. So yeah, that's a good one, Robbie. Anyone else? Decision maker. Yep, decision maker, often making sort of hard decisions. Um, a lot of things that you need to balance and grapple um, across you know, business, tech, and UX. And which sort of leads to that this, this slide say, um, you know, when we think about product management and, and even product leadership, really, um, it's really at, it sits at the intersection between UX tech and, and business. So I picked up this quote from Marty Kagan. He's a founder of the Silicon, uh, product, uh, Silicon Valley product group. So uh, what Mar Marty says was, job of product management is to discover a product that is valuable, usable, and feasible. So valuable in a sense that there's business and customer value, um, you know, so whether it helps to uh, achieve a business goal of like growing its user base, whether it helps to generate revenue um, from a usable perspective or from a user experience perspective, um, how easy and frictionless is for customers to use it? Is it delightful for customers to use? And finally, is it feasible? So we have like all these like, great ideas and you know, commercially it sounds really good, it's a good business idea. Uh, customers really want to use it, but can we actually build it you know, from a technology standpoint? How complex it is, is it actually feasible? So product management is all, is the back to the gentleman back um, who, who mentioned suggested it's around bringing different teams together is bringing different discipline and it's precisely bringing ux tech uh, and business all together and trying to um you know coordinate and, and sort of drive together uh, decisions uh, to build build the right experience for customers that adds value or solves a problem for me um product management and product leadership is not mutually exclusive um you could be a product manager that delves into the realm of doing some product leadership stuff. Um, as, a product lead, as a product leader, you'll be doing kind of product management stuff as well. So the two are sort of interlinked. Um, and I'm sort of drawing this from some sort of, some, some of it from some sort of academic sort of textbook and, and sort of courses I've been on and also primarily based on my experience and being a product lead back at Barclays um, and now um, a product lead at Monis as well. So just, just sort of like these are, so, I think this is this is not a sort of comprehensive list by any means, but you know, from my experience, there's sort of like three things and three sort of contrasts that really um, comes to mind for me. So, from a product management side, it's around building things right, um, and what I mean by that is you know effective execution. So, if you if you have an idea and you have a problem that you want to tackle, um, you know, you, you use the best tools, you use the best framework, you know how to approach a problem, you know how to use data and insights and user and customer feedback to help you uh, decide how to build it and what you sort of get into building it with your engineering team. Um, you're, you're hopefully using your best practices, you're working in a more sort of agile way to, to sort of de deliver things uh, out to a customer. So that's around efficiency, optimization, building things right. Um, and on the flip side, when you think about product leadership, um, you're really trying to, it's, it's product, building things right is execution and building the right things is really the strategy. So not, not to, I'm not saying that product managers don't do strategy, um, they should be doing strategy, but what I, what I tend to notice is um, as you sort of progress from, from you know, be, uh, the, the realm of being product man manager, man manager where you, you tend to um, I guess harbour less experience than, than somebody who, 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 who has experience leading that multiple products. Uh, people who have experience not leading portfolio product or multiple products uh, tend to have a very, very clear vision and strategy around you know, where you want to take. So I'm not just talking about a six month vision. Um, we, we should absolutely have a vision on um, where the product should be going in two years time, for instance, or, or even better yet, five years time. I know five, five years time is a bit um, uncomprehensible, but at least you know, in terms of blue sky thinking in terms of um, being kind of creative with, with the, the possibilities. Um, the, the product leader should be the person who um, you know, sets that direction and drives the team towards that direction and, and help the team figure out you know, what we should be building uh, and building the right things. Um, so that's this sort of like slight contrast there. And I think that you know, increasingly, I think as, as a sort of effective product manager, eventually you will move into more of the realm of building right things, which is going for execution and strategy and back to execution again. So the second thing is 
managing teams. So um, just kind of speaking from my experience when I first started off um, as a product manager back at America Express where um, I was working in kind of dedicated feature teams or scrum teams. So a, for those that are, are not familiar with terminology, a feature team or scrum team is just a dedicated team that works on a particular area of products uh, that comprise of engineers, testers, uh, designers, uh, and obviously the, the product person as well, so whether they're product manager or senior product manager or product lead. Um, so, manage, so managing a team is, is hard work, so how do you kind of coordinate all those sort of tasks between um, team members? How do you, if you work in an agile fashion, how do you uh, effectively run all the uh, agile ceremonies? So for example, you have the daily stand up where everyone gives a sort of like quick sort of um, summary of you know what they're working on today, what they're working on yesterday, uh, what they what, what they're working on uh, yesterday, what they're working on today, and if they have any blockers or impediments, you have um, your sprint retro. So after every two weeks, you do a reflection of what went well and what could be improved, for instance. Um, so you know, managing a team is kind of uh, doing a lot of that. You know, just um, making sure that. Um, the work as you're building a product is well coordinated. There's the, the aspect of managing stakeholders, um, so on and so forth. When I when I think about leading teams, and especially the case when it comes to Monis, um, it's around um, skillful coaching, delegation, guidance, and also learning how to develop uh, and build high performing teams. So it's it's not just simply a case of uh, coordinating uh, between team members, making sure they get things done. It's about you know having empathy for team members, uh, having uh, understanding how to kind of set progression for team members, work with them to kind of define objectives, um, have kind of encourage kind of regular feedback, um, build that sort of culture of using data, um, and, and and having the team not be afraid to sort of feed feed uh, feedback to you at any time, and also take on board. Um, uh, what your team is sort of telling you as well. So um, leading teams is sort of, you know, setting the right example and, and, and to your point earlier about being respected. Um, and, and that comes with you know, showing kind of genuine empathy for the wider team members and also um, helping them just to become better. So um, I think that was a sort of like slight difference from, from my transition from when I first started doing product management back at Amex and to now Moniz where um, really the the um, I guess you know the whole sort of progression and sort of the well-being, the health of the team is also dependent on um, dependent. I, I, I'm ultimately accountable for for for, for their success uh, and also their failure at the same time. So that's that's a slight sort of um, change, shift in mindset. Um, and that sort of leads to my, my last point on sort of responsibility. So as a sort of uh, from the product management field, you might be responsible for a certain area or a certain product. Um, as you sort of move more towards product leadership, as your the scope of your product expands, so you might be looking at a much bigger product portfolio. You might be looking at uh, multiple products, for instance. Um, you're really looking at full accountability. So um, any sort of risk you, you're fully accountable for. There isn't a there, there isn't necessarily some somebody that you need um, that that helps shelter that sort of accountability for you. Um, in terms of uh, uh, PNL, in terms of finances, commercial viability, um, you should understand all the unit economics of your product. Uh, that should be easily done by another team. You should be fully accountable. You should know that if you're, for example, one of the products I work at Moniz is uh, global payments and FX. Um, that has a direct uh, contribution towards the bottom line. So it has a direct contribution towards uh, making the company money. So I should understand uh, what are the costs of making FX payments? What are the partnership deals that we have? Um, I should understand, you know, um, if I wanted to offer these new routes, uh, new currencies to customers, what does that entail? And a lot of that sort of decision making um, should sit within uh, my team. Um, so, so when it comes to ultimate accountability, um, we're not relying on other people and we're not blaming other people. If things go wrong, a lot of the, um, uh, and we should have full kind of insight into uh, everything um, from, uh, you know, tech feasibility, and more importantly, all the kind of, you own the kind of profit and loss, uh, and ultimately accountable for the success or failure of the product. So, that was a very quick overview of sort of product management for product leadership. Um, I know there was there. I'm, I'm sort of approaching it with some kind of prior assumptions that people know uh, know, know what product management is. Um, I, I didn't want to kind of 
go too much into the fundamental and basics that, that might have been covered in previous <coughs> events before. Um, one of the things about product leadership I mentioned is setting a clear and compelling vision and strategy. Um, so it's around being kind of forward thinking, so which kind of ties closely with um, the next part that I'm about to speak about, which is innovation. Really, um, innovation, um, there's been so much like academic uh, text, textbook and, and research on, on, on this topic. And innovation is quite a broad field and broad discipline, really. Um, but I guess one of the things, so, so the framework I've shown you is not a, it, it, it's, it's not an absolute guidance. Um, it's just a, anything that I share to do, to do is just food for thought. It's really just a tool to help you, um, I guess, like delve a bit deeper into a topic. And um, you might find contrast with you. You might, not, you might disagree with the model. And that's all good. Uh, that's all food for thought. Um, one of the models that kind of tracked me uh, Back when I was doing my uh, master's degree in management, was um, something uh, this the innovation model that's suggested by uh, uh, Clayton uh, Christensen, who was a Harvard Business uh, professor. So he actually suggested this model back in uh, 1995, and it's been kind of iterated a lot over the years. So he basically proposed that there's really two main types of innovation. So there is the uh, sustaining innovation on one side, and there is the disruptive innovation on the other side. So sustaining innovation is any sort of improvement in innovation that um, doesn't necessarily change the existing market, right? And disruptive innovation is, is on the opposite. So anything that changes and displaces the existing market. So we could probably think of some example quickly that comes to mind. So think about how Spotify has changed the, the, the sort of music industry. Think about how Uber has changed the taxi industry. Um, how um, you know, Netflix, for instance, uh, for, for instance, displaced Blockbuster. Uh, a number of, so there's a number of, sort of disruptive innovation out there. Um, and then sustaining innovation is all the sort of stuff that we just discuss as a group. So, you know, making things, make, making new things, making new things better. Um, a lot of that would sit under sustaining innovation. And with sustaining innovation um, comes two parts. So there's incremental innovation and there's also radical innovation. So incremental innovation is really just, when we think, think about increment, it's a small improvement. So any sort of small improvement um, to, to, to make the product better. So whether it provides a better benefit, a small enhancement, whether it solves a problem better, these are incremental innovations. So um, to give an example, it might be um, your iPhone. So your iPhone um, being, being more, so performance being, 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 being more effective, your iPhone being lighter, um, the phone being faster. These are sort of like small incremental improvements that are being made all the time. It is an innovation at the end of the day, but um, it's nothing that really disrupts the market. Um, like, like, like when smartphones has first been introduced or when iPod has first been introduced and changed those who are music industry uh, completely. Um, radical innovation um, is, again, it's, it's still sustaining. It is when um, there's a new sort of technology, there's a new sort of uh, idea innovation that is drastically different. Um, however, it still has still failed to kind of disrupt the industry in a way that um, the likes of Airbnb, Uber, uh, et cetera, ha has done. When you think about disruptive innovation, actually, um, not many businesses, going back to Uber, for, for instance, um, the technology behind it was never really groundbreaking. It was never really that radical, to be honest. It's the way technology has been applied um, you know, for, for Uber, they basically leveraged the Google API for the maps. They then used Braintree, which is a kind of third party uh, payment processor. They kind of connected a few things, added some kind of really slick user experience. Um, and then uh, Shazam, they, they are now, you know, one of the most like, valuable apps in the world, um, looking to IPO at over $100 billion. So disruptive innovation is not necessarily something that's really radical and groundbreaking, um, but it's just applied in such a way that um, eventually it displaces the market. So to further to go on this model, and again, food for thought. Um, so this is what um, Clayton has sort of proposed uh, as a sort of digital um, disruption, uh, curve, well, dis disruptive innovation curve, um, how, how the adoption curve looks like. So really um, what he's kind of proposing here is um, with disruptive innovation, you sort of start off low with a beach hack segment. So you start off with... Uh, probably a low end use case. You probably have a few sort of niche customers. You probably are trying to solve problem for a very small market only. Um, and at that time, um, disruptive innovation, why you tend to see that in 
startups more rather than big corporation is because when you're sort of disrupting and beginning the, the journey of disrupting innovation right at the low end, um, it's not very profitable. So if you think of like Monzo, for instance, um, offering, say, free FX, so spending overseas for free and all that stuff. Um, again, um, big banks can't offer it, but it, 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 it's a big sort of that tack, uh, tick on the margin um, it, it, from a commercial perspective. Um, it's not quite, you know, it's not quite attractive to sort of compete on that ground from the start. Um, so, but but as 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 sort of like the these kind of new players as they sort of grow over time, as they kind of performance improve over time. So you could probably uh, attest to all your sort of mobile banking apps having newer functionality. Um, now you know offering that savings account, offering these things that big banks in the past. Um, has never really felt as a threat before. You know, they felt that okay, these are um, you know Monzo and those, those, those Monzo Monis and those guys are really just um, loss leaders. So they are offering things for cheap to try to win customers, but um, nothing about them is sustainable because they're not not generating revenue by any means. But as as they start to notice all these kind of fintechs and start booming, and and as over time increasing the performance, adding new features, solving customer problem better. Eventually, what you start to use, uh, see is that their, their innovation start to go from the low end use where, where it's not as possible, slowly up to main, the mainstream use, and that's at the, top, the, the, the cost where um, you know, incumbents and bigger banks and bigger uh, companies uh, should feel threatened. So it's, it's, it's really, you know, this, this is an illustration to, 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 to sort of like highlight the fact that why startup um, tend to innovate slightly better than, than say, corporations sometimes, where corporations um, are, it's not that they, they're, they're necessarily not aware of disruptive innovation, but at the start, um, they're really not paying too, too, too much thought to it because it, it's not lucrative enough for them to uh, really get into action until once it reached a point where, you know, they start to see mainstream players um, um, start getting attraction, start delivering a value, start catching as leading their market share. That's when the big banks are doing doing some things about it, uh, and we can see that because we see big banks trying to acquire a lot of the fintech companies and try to partner with them now, and um, they, they sense a real threat in the industry because of that. So that was a bit of um, a sort of overview of innovation, the potential different types of innovation. I spoke about you know in incremental innovation. There are kind of innovation out there that disrupts and displaces markets completely. There are radical innovations, so tech innovation that um, it's great, but doesn't quite change the whole market um, uh, like some of the more disruptive companies. Um, now, how do we sort of think about innovation more practically um, when we're building products? Um, so this is, this is what I want to talk about now. So one of the so one of the sort of like frameworks and one of the tools that we use in product management is called outcome driven innovation. Really, um, for those in product management, you probably heard of the you know the term jobs to be done, and that's really just a byproduct of outcome driven innovation. There is many different types of outcome driven innovation, um, and really when we say outcome driven innovation, we're thinking about um, you know let's let's not. Everyone should be doing innovation, and to, to be honest, innovation could come from just people in this room to all come together, brainstorming ideas, but how do you know that these ideas, solution that you come up with actually solves a real problem that the customers want or solves a real prof, uh, problem in society? So one way to sort of manage this sort of risk a bit better is to uh, work in frameworks such as outcome-driven innovation. So, for instance, if you have a... Um, if you first sort of start up with a sort of mindset or, and, and, and sort of the, the approach of trying to understand what the customer wants to achieve from this product or, or this feature, um, you, you did denote that as the starting point. Um, and you then sort of break down, okay, if this is the outcome, what are the supporting things that, that, that the customer care about to reach this outcome? So once you sort of frame, frame it that way, say, okay, for instance, um, one example that I, I've taken from uh, Nielsen Norman, which is um, probably, the, uh, probably the number one uh, leaders in sort of user experience research, uh, is, for example, it, we start with the first statement of jobs to be done. Um, the, the outcome for the customer is they want to travel to another city for a conference. Um, now, what does that entail? So... On the left-hand side, you have the functional criteria. So, for example, um, 
the customer may want, uh, the, the, the need might be, you know, total travel time needs to be less than a full day. Um, they can bring enough personal belonging for a length of a trip and also the cost is within travel budget. So these are very sort of functional things that when you think about uh, to achieve this outcome at the top. Um, there's also sort of emotional criteria um, that you know, supports build, building a great product. And, and um, when we think about building, break, uh, building a great product for a customer, we think about you know, empathy, we think about uh, emotional effects, we think about you know, the delightfulness and that sort of thing, so, which is why we have a, outside of just simply a functional criteria, we also have an emotional criteria. Um, now, in the emotional criteria, it could be, okay, for my personal emotional criteria, it could be comfortable, so there's enough leg and shoulder room and water to drink, for instance, and also the fact that I want to be treated respectfully, uh, for instance. So once you sort of frame it these ways, that uh, you, you sort of have your first job to be done, so we define you know, what the outcome, what's the outcome that we want to achieve uh, for the customer. We define, okay, what is the customer's sort of functional criteria to meet this like, outcome at the top, we also would, would help to sort of understand and, and put ourselves in the customer's shoes, say, okay, emotionally, this is, these are the sort of elements and these are the criteria that we need to meet um, to, to achieve emotional satisfaction. So as a, as a team, when we're coming up with solutions, we're not just brainstorming and say, okay, this is a cool idea, this, let's do this, let's do that. We're actually coming up with solutions um, tailored towards a specific outcome or, or a problem. So that's essentially uh, the crux of outcome-driven innovation. So I guess you know, the, first, the first part of um, outcome, innova outcome innovation, uh, driven innovation is you know, try to understand um, you know, what the customer wants to, to, to achieve, try to frame the problem well. Um, and, and the next step is obviously you know, how you think about and how you solutionize to address um, some of these problems. So one of the things I want to talk about is there's a number of different ways to tackle it, but one of the things that I, I like to do um, and the, the way I sort of think about problems is um, what we call kind of first principle thinking. Um, so it's a way for, for me to sort of think. Um, when we, we often say think outside the box, we often say, talk about um, finding creative solution, innovative solution, etc. But um, I guess nobody has really, uh, I guess not many people has really thought about how we uh, actually go approach um, pro problem solving really and, and come up with a new solution. So first principle thinking is really about questioning fraud assumptions uh, and building something complete from scratch. So I think most people here, we sort of learn from reference experiences. I learn from reference experiences. Uh, it's just a lot easier than trying to kind of pick up everything yourself. So for example, um, you know, uh, we know that if you jump out a window for a second floor, it, it, it's, it's, going, it's going to hurt. You, you don't need to try that yourself to, to actually know that we, we learn from reference data. So a lot of people learn and think about things um, based on analogy. Now, some of these assumptions might be right. Some of these assumptions might be flawed. And first principle, think, first principle thinking is really questioning all these assumptions um, before um, you, you really dive into coming up with a solution. So um, Elon Musk, everyone know who Elon Musk is? Cool. Founder of Tesla and previously, uh, you know, PayPal, SpaceX, etc. Um, one of the sort of analogies that uh, he uses in one of his interviews that I found was quite interesting was, um, okay, electric vehicles aren't sustainable. People might say electric vehicles aren't quite sustainable because the battery costs are too high, um, which is true to some extent because I think um, but the, the example we gave, battery costs was cost around 800 uh, kilowatt per hour, for instance. Um, but when you sort of apply first principle of thinking and you sort of understand, okay, what are the sort of material constituents of a battery? Um, what are the sort of raw materials that, that, that make up a battery? So you sort of have a nickel, cobalt, aluminium, you have sort of poly, uh, polymers, for instance. And, uh, and when you look at, you break, you break down these materials and look at the stock value of, of these materials, actually it only adds up to around $80 per kilowatt hour. So massive difference from $80 to, you know, $800, you know, around, you know, difference of about 10 times. So we just need to find a way to sort of source these material cheaply and find a way to, you know, effectively and efficiently transform these mat raw materials into a battery, for instance. So when you sort of think of problems this way, decompose it, try to question, okay, is it really the case? Is it really the case that uh, is, it my, is my understanding really true or can I sort of decompose this problem into smaller bits um, and, and, and find a new way to sort of approach this? Um, that's that's, that's the, uh, essentially the sort of um, 
highlight of, of what first principle thinking is. Cool, so we spoke a bit about you know, product leaders, product, man, uh, product, leader, product managers, um, what are the sort of expectation of product leaders. So just quickly summarize, you know, product leaders are still product managers, um, except that you know, product leaders um, ha have, um, you know, ex have expectations in, in sort of leading and building a high performing team. They are you know, ultimately accountable for every facet of uh, facet success or failure of the product. Um, and also um, think about you know, the, the vision, uh, think about be, being forward thinking, creating a campaign strategy, et cetera. So um, no surprise, uh, as a product leader, we need to think about you know, how we can sort of apply innovation, how we, how we can apply new ideas, how we could think about you know, solving uh, existing problems and also and, and unanticipated problems at the same time. So um, on a sort of more practical level, um, so I, I got this from Gartner, who's a sort of, um, Gartner is a kind of prominent research uh, agency, um, well, not research company, rather than agency, um, that provides kind of industry insights into a number of different topics, uh, and they, particularly, um, they have particularly rich insights into sort of digital transformation, product development, and that sort of thing. Um, and I think that really, this is something that um, really, um, it's consistent with with like the the way I like to think about product management, where it is part of it is a science, but a part of it is an art, and, and you sort of learn different frameworks and concepts all the time. So just now, I brought up a few concepts from you know the different type of innovation. I spoke about you know how we sort of lead a team. I spoke about agile product development, what you work, for, how you work for engineers. I spoke about um, outcome driven innovation and divining customer problems, research and all that stuff. So really there's, there's a multitude of different things at your disposal. Um, there isn't a, really a right or wrong way um, to build a product. Um, I guess the, you know, the important sort of takeaway for me is um, it needs any sort of decision it made needs to be data back, needs to be research backed, you know, it needs to be uh, based on um, solving a problem or, or creating that like, immense value for a customer. Um, uh, so on and so forth. But um, here, here really, um, this is typically um, something that kind of correlates quite closely with how we do product management at Monis, um, and to some degree how we did do product management at Barclays at the same time. So, so a few sort of things is, um, you know, you, you first need to come up with and understand what the problem is. Um, so I mentioned outcome-driven innovation, jobs to be done, working being outcome-driven. Um, there, 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 there was also uh, design thinking and customer empathy at the same time. So putting yourself in a customer's shoe, try to understand what the customer pain points are, um, trying to identify any sort of customer needs, observing them. So I'm just kind of going through sort of, sort of that, that sort of uh, process from left to right. So as you saw, um, once you saw identify what the needs are, you have to um, understand the in insight, prioritize, etc. And that's when you start brainstorming concept. And when you brainstorm concept at this point, um, that's where you apply your first principle of thinking. So you understand what the problem is. Um, you have a clear grasp of, you know, all the, using, by using data, speaking to the customer, using research, you know what the problem is. Now you've got to think creatively with your team, come up with the ideas, and you don't just brainstorm solution for the sake of solution. It needs to be a solution that addresses the problem that you defined early on by using outcome in a driven innovation and also design thinking. Um, once you sort of come up with a bunch of ideas, um, how do we then know what do we apply uh, and, and what, what should we take forward and what should we kill, um, what should we test, etc. So you, you as a sort of product manager or you as a product lead would come up with a few hypotheses of um, what's, uh, or what you should test. So your hypothesis could be Okay, if I, um, so I'm, I'm just taking my, my example. Um, if I um, make these changes to the global payments um, user's journey, um, then this should drive a improvement by the t engagement in, uh, uh, engagement improvement of 10%, that sort of thing. So um, how we might kind of go about testing it, we run, we could do um, a number of different things. So we could do something called A-B testing, where you have a, we give out two versions to a customer. You could even kind of scale that into having a multi, uh, multiple uh, variants. So you could do like three design variants, four design variants, you have different sort of ideas on testing, uh, testing for engagement. Um, 
outside of kind of building actual products, um, really um, what happens in the middle is what we call sort of lean experimentation. So we're trying to get quick and dirty insights as fast as possible. So where, where I can, I try to use the lowest effort uh, to get the fastest feedback. So whether that's, that's kind of coming up with a paper prototype, uh, speaking, to, uh, speaking to users or speaking internally, whether it's kind of creating a sort of survey sending out customers who can get some sort of uh, initial engagement and understanding of uh, what they want. Um, there's a number of ways um, to approach sort of experimentation outside of actually bring, building a prototype or building actual product in the hands of customers. So I'm um, not going to go into this in too much depth. Uh, there's a book called uh, Lean Startup and that talks about this sort of sort of uh, theory uh, and this sort of approach very well. Um, but essentially, um, what I what, want, to, want to sort of summarize here is you start up with kind of define the problem, brainstorm concept, use the first principle of thinking, um, and then you move into the next part where it's like, aha, I have like 10 uh, solutions now. With me and my team came up with 10 solutions that addresses these problem. Now I need to prioritize the top three things that I potentially want to test. Uh, and you go through this like, very, very quick cycle of testing these ideas and best to test with customers, obviously, um, to get feedback on uh, what works and what doesn't work, so you know not to invest too much time into it um, before it's too late. So um, right now, there's sort of, um, as you saw, perform this sort of iteration, it's in circle because everything we do in product management tend to be sort of um, iterative and cyclical. So um, we're hoping to sort of reach what we call product market fit. So hopefully with all these sort of, uh, we approach the problem right, we, we, we define the problem right, we come up with a good solution, now we're testing the solution, hopefully one of these solutions will hit home, hopefully one of these solutions will really help to solve the customer problem or add a, a, a great benefit to um, our, our customers or, or, or address the problem um, that we're trying to solve. So at, at this point here, we're really reaching product market fit. That's when you know, okay, I tested with customers, Feedback was great. I know I have you know, strong confidence that if I was to roll this out with customers now, um, this would be something that our customers want and it'll, you know, it should, in, in theory, bring you know, X, Y, Z benefit to our customers and also our company at, at the same time. So F, back to FX payments. So suppose I tested, I ran a test that tested three to four different um, global payments flow. Um, I found that that one actually has significant sort of benefit. So it actually drove uh, global payments by 15% without affecting any other parts of the app. Um, I, might then just, uh, I might then decide to work with my team and say, okay, you know, this is a no brainer. I tested four versions against the base variant. Um, I now want to build it with my team. Um, and you, you start to, that's when you get into the actual sort of process of uh, product development. So uh, here is where we call sort of agile product development. Um, you're writing requirements or what we call in agile product development called uh, user stories. We try to convey exactly what the customers want. Um, we try to convey, you know, what are the sort of acceptance criteria. So, uh, th 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 so it, it's, it's a mechanism for com communicating with your engineers. So your engineers know exactly what you build. Um, you uh, obviously work with the, your designers to design, um, to, to sort of refine the design, uh, make, making sure that, so do you have a question? Yeah, I mean, for the product managers, that might be an obvious question, but the yep. user stories, yes. who normally writes those? The product manager or the engineer? So the user story is never by the engineer, so the user story is uh, essentially a requirement and a specification for the engineers to build um, build off. So um, in theory, um, your, your user story um, should have enough accepted criteria. So after the, the, your engineer build a product or build, build a certain aspect of a the product, they should be able to refer and reflect back to the accepted criteria to say, okay, accepted criteria one, two, three, four, which are the nitty gritty detail of how it needs to perform or how it needs to functionally behave. Uh, these, these are actually met the user story, we basically write it in a, such a way that's very user friendly because we don't want to um, complicate things. Um, if you're writing, if, you're, if you can't explain um, your user story and can't, can't explain uh, why you're writing user story, then you, you probably have to rethink um, whether, it, it, it's the, whether it's the right thing to build or not. So to give an example of a user story, um, say, uh, so for example, as a customer, I want to be able to uh, quickly uh, send money to someone in another country. 
um, as, so I could save uh, time and money. So, so that, that's assuming. So that, that's a story for say optimizing the global payments flow to make it faster to, to send global payments. So why do we want to make it faster? As a customer, I want to make, I want to, well, I want to be able to quickly send that because I want to save time and money. So we need to uh, we need to clearly um, define uh, who you are as a customer. You need to clearly define what you're trying to do and also what are the sort of benefit of doing so. So that's that, that's the crux of a user story. Um, it should be written by the product owner. Um, some, in my team, for instance, um, I I write most of my user stories. I, I write. Um, I write acceptance criteria as well, and I tend to have a product analyst who sort of go even deeper into the detail just to make for more complicated uh, sort of product and features um, to, uh, to, to make sure that's right. Cool. So, as mentioned, so um, is everyone familiar with when I say agile product development? In the past, software development, when it began, you know, the good sort of like 40, 40 ish years ago, um, what tends to happen is it happened, it, it's conducted in a very waterfall fashion. Um, and, and the re reason why it's called waterfall is because it goes from like one step to another and it trickles down. So, for example, you start up with uh, requirements gathering, you start to, uh, and, and that, that process at the top might take months, uh, and then you go into uh, scoping to figure out, you know, um, uh, you know, is this what a business wants? Speak to the, uh, is this uh, what our users want, etc. Uh, and then you go into design. Design phase could take another, say, two, 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 three months. And then you go into build, and then you go into testing. And all of these are sort of like uh, they, they never really happen in parallel. They happen like sequentially, one other than another. Um, so what ends what ends up happen is um, you invest all this time. You invest five, six, seven months into building a product, um, and sometimes um, by by then you're already outpaced by competition. Or actually, if you have done the work incorrectly at the start, um, you're you're essentially wasting say six, seven months time building the wrong things for customers. So, which is why we go through this whole process of trying to get feedback to make sure you know hopefully you define a problem right, do experiment. At this point, you're already you know. 80% certain that you're building the right thing, but obviously um, uh, when it comes to building a product, um, things can be done, things can change, market condition, competitive pressure, all the different things. Um, the idea around agile product development is it happens in quick sprint cycles. Instead of like, taking five, six, seven months to do, um, we do it in iterations of say two weeks. So every two weeks you should be working with a team to build a product increment that potentially is shippable to a customer. So rather than, for example, um, using an example of uh, if I was to want to build out the payments, um, global payments functionality to send um, money to, say, 30 different countries, for instance, um, that might take me and my team a whole year to build. So why don't I just kind of decompose it into more manageable chunks and something that customers can use like, relatively quickly? So why don't I just start and prioritize the first two currencies to begin with? And why don't I just, instead of building all these like, fancy things and things that people might not want in the end, why don't I just focus on the thing that I know the customer want the most? So transparency of cost, for instance, or, or be able to quickly send, say, send money in, in, in two, two steps. So that might be what a customer wants. So um, as you... Because you're building in such that rapid cycle, you get feedback from a customer, you get feedback from a team, um, you're able to continuously improve and read. Uh, if you heard of like in, for those who started business before, um, in, in, in Japan there's this concept called Kaizen, which is continuous improvement. Um, Agile sort of um, plays on that, that concept, continuous improvement. You're constantly looking to refine and improve the way you do things. Um, and, uh, and hopefully, um, you know, we're delivering uh, customer value um, quickly at the same time and we're avoiding uh, the, the risk of building the wrong things. Cool. So just like the very last slide uh, that I'm going to go through. So um, I talked about defining problems. I talked about coming up with solutions, um, how you should be testing and running experiments, and ultimately kind of building it in a more sort of agile, uh, um, agile way. Um, try to release stuff to customers very quickly. Um, when it comes to innovation, sometimes uh, the people doing innovation um, might be uh, in competitors, might be people outside your industry, uh, and, and it might it just might be uh, more sort of practical to think about partnerships and think about you know integrating with uh, other people rather than building it yourself. So, for instance, um, so who here has a Monzo account? Okay, most people have a Monzo account. Cool. So, 
Monzo, for instance, um, their global payment is not done. It, it's not done by themselves um, simply because you know the, to build up the the global payments it requires sort of like infrastructure uh, agreement uh, with local banks in different countries to to this thing, send money quickly. Um, it's a very very massive uh, undertaking. Um, for whereas you could quickly partner with someone like Transferwise, who's you know had is it, it, one of the leaders in uh, foreign exchange. They've been doing it for five, six, seven years. Um, they have you know um, built up these that solid commercial relationship and have very competitive rates and, and delivery times compared to a number of different partners. So why try to you know tackle some of this? To, uh, why try to tackle uh, this this big problem when you have someone who. Uh, a company with say 1,000 people that have been focusing on this problem for uh, six, seven years. So why not try to partner with them and leverage some of their capability? Um, so there, there are some instances where you know partnerships um, uh, are a way where you could assimilate and apply innovation to um, your own company and product at the same time. So back at Barclays, um, I was looking at innovation. I was looking at partnerships, building partnerships, um, and one of my sort of tasks was. Uh, you know, come up with this sort of innovation framework, and this is a framework that um, uh, I that, that was inspired by a number of different things. But ultimately, I came up with this to help um, identify good sort of like fintech partners for Barclays. Um, so really, this is a four-step process. Um, we start with identify, and then we go to screen, and then we go to test and execute. Um, from the sort of identification um, side, what we're really uh, looking to do is we're trying to identify a partnership that helps support business goals or customer goals. So whether um, these partnerships help to grow our user numbers, it helps to help make revenue, it helps to uh, meet a customer need that we're currently unable to provide, um, whether it's um, something that, that's re just really damn cool and would you know, delight our customers, that's something that we, that we can't do at, at the moment. Um, so you know, what, what should be, we be looking at? So um, it's quite a broad thing, so I try to kind of focus on uh, the stuff that I think is sort of priority according to uh, the company's sort of goals and, and, and vision at the time. Um, I look at you know, emerging and disruptive technologies, not just in the sort of banking and financial technology circle, but also in other, uh, in other sort of uh, fields and industry as well. Um, I look at sort of trends, so there's a number of sort of external data and people who kind of focus on procuring these sort of reports, industry reports from, from like Forrester, 11FS, Gartner, etc. on uh, what are the sort of like digital trends, what are the sort of um, digital banking uh, trends, etc. Please. Yeah. So if you like start a partnership, is it normally that you would find like a trend that you're interested in and then have someone or you research kind of the partners that could be interesting? Or is it more the partners reach out to you? How does that procurement work? Yeah, so it's really a combination. So um, a lot of time people reach out to me uh, on, on LinkedIn. Um, but I think of the sort of really high value partnerships. So I um, partly is that you need to be kind of well connected with the industry. You need to participate in uh, a number of sort of industry events. You need to kind of uh, be be aware of, for example, um, I, I talk about the how later on. Um, so how you might go about, so there's like website like Hacker News, AngelList, Crunchbase, there's that crowd queue where, where there's a number of um, startups are, are, are being sort of, um, are raising finance for instance, or seeders for instance. Um, I often would sort of check through and uh, on a sort of um, regular basis just to check out you know, what are the potential companies uh, there that we could look into. Um, I, I then sort of like prioritize and, and sort of collate a list based on um, the stuff that I, I, I think are interesting and aligns with our strategic goals and I think tr could truly potentially solve a real problem or apply a great benefit and I sort of uh, compare it with the, the other partners that come reach out to me. So um, we sort of, um, once, once, once these uh, are identified, we move on to the next stage, which is screening, um, which we want to talk about now. So um, really at the screening stage, um, we're looking at ideas and partnership that could potentially meet product market fit. Um, we want to see that it's you know, commercially viable and also technically feasible. So um, there's no point um, there's no point doing a sort of partnership that that you know where uh, the the sort of the the, the cost the cost and benefit uh, doesn't weigh up. So, for example, it might take a, a year to sort of integrate or build. Um, that's too much. Uh, and you need to think about opportunity cost. So, if it's going to take a year to to partner with these, the, these people, or what what are the other things we could do um, with our resources during this year, for instance? 
Um, does it really address the real problem um, and et cetera? So really at this screening stage, we're looking to sort of prioritize these different opportunities. Um, and how I sort of go about that is um, I created this sort of like evaluation mat matrix for our partners um, that covers really two aspects, so company and also product. So from a company perspective, um, there's, it's actually quite a comprehensive list that I don't have on me right now, um, but uh, essentially uh, it's a checklist of probably uh, around 15 different points uh, and on the product side, I sort of try to understand, okay, has, what is the stage of development the product is currently at? Has it, has it got, uh, what is the customer traction? Has it, so customer traction is not usually supported by, if you see paying customers, then that usually a good signal to, to, uh, to indicate that, and you know, the product is good enough that uh, customers are willing to pay money, for instance. Um, what um, we, we look at, you know, what, what is the sort of, the age of the product, is it an MVP? How long has it been, been, been launched for? Um, we look at, uh, you know, what, what are their sort of unique selling points? We look at, um, for example, do they have a sort of uh, unfair competitive advantage that other people can't copy, for instance? Uh, or is it something that, um, you know, they, they do really cool now, but easily some, somebody tomorrow could uh, come up with a similar business model, similar idea, or we could actually do ourselves really. So is it something that proprietary to them? So we look at product perspective. Uh, on the other hand, we also think about company. So we think about, okay, the company, um, how, um, how, uh, guess up, how, how mature, how experienced is the management team? Uh, has the, for example, the management co-founding team, have they had a successful exit in the past? Have they shot any strong commercial partnerships? Um, have they, uh, what, what round of, um, uh, what, what round of um, financing are they at? Are they at the Series A, Series B? Um, what was their last round? Um, and, and sort of like a number of different things um, that, that sort of measures, okay, product, um, how, how, uh, how valuable it is, and from a company perspective, where it ranks as, as well. So you sort of, um, when, you give, give, when you give a mark from say one to five, um, across the number of and you t sort of tally up, and you, obviously some categories have a higher weighting, you sort of then have a more scientific approach to evaluating your partners. So some of it um, is based on, you know, um, some of it is based on gut feel, but a lot of it I try to, you know, try, try to, uh, uh, funnel into to a little screening process because at the end of the day when you have uh, 30 partners contacting you there needs there needs to be a way to sort of um, be consistent um, to screen out partners cool so next next thing is um, once you sort of screen out partners and we see that it's you know they have potentially achieved product market fit they are a strong company we think where they're going places we think that um, uh, you know, commercially, it's viable for us as well. You know, we we'll, we potentially, you know, we're not losing money. Potentially, we're making money with, with those guys, and technically, it's, it's quite feasible. Um, that's when um, we uh, we could sort of continue the test phase. So, um, for those who need Monzo, um, who here uses Flux? Cool. So, a few few people here are aware of Flux. So, Flux is a digital receipt integration, for instance, um, where Right now, it's only available in a few retailers. Um, so if you're spending each, for instance, um, uh, instead of receiving a paper receipt, your whole digital receipt will appear in your uh, Monzo app. And the sort of future thinking behind it is that that would then be kind of connected to uh, like loyalty schemes. So every time you go spend uh, in store and using your Monzo card, Monzo card or, or starting card, whoever support Flux, um, you would then um, earn uh, loyalty stamps uh, all digitally uh, and, and all managed through your, your, your digital mobile banking app. Um, imagine um, for the, the, there's other kind of popular loyalty schemes, uh, imagine Nando's for instance, every time you go to Nando's, you could, uh, instead of having a carrying the Nando's card, that would be automatically sort of populated um, in, in your banking app. So very convenient, right? So Flux was actually one of the sort of businesses that came through the Barclays Tech Stars Accelerator. Um, and again, in terms of like how uh, Flux was sort of, uh, kind of, kind of uh, assessed. Um, they, yeah, Flux had went through the same process in terms of um, Barclay had to understand whether they were, re uh, they had product market fit, what was the sort of um, uh, maturity experience of the management team, um, what was the, uh, what's the, uh, do they have a unique selling point, um, are, are they commercially viable? Uh, with Barclays, et cetera. So the same sort of like ratif uh, ratification and screening process uh, went down with um, something like Flux, for instance.
Cool. So once you get to the screening phase, oh, you basically go to the test phase. So if you sort of like recall back to what I talked about in terms of lean experimentation, um, that's really what, what you want to do in this stage. You want to uh, dedicate the least amount of effort to get the results that you want. So whether it's sort of building a sort of a uh, quick prototype within a week, whether it's that piloting to just a few users with like basic functionality, um, you need to find the best way to get quick responses. Um, what I don't advocate is spending uh, months to build, uh, to, to build something to test it, uh, only to um, you know, prove to be a, a sort of, uh, uh, sour test or, or partnership. So um, really the testing phase, uh, as I sort of uh, mentioned here, is that's when you really want to kind of determine you know, which idea you want to pursue. Um, and which idea you want to kind of keep on the side and which idea you want to kind of kill completely. Um, there's no point wasting time with something that shows no promise. Um, I talk that the how is basically, um, uh, I'll, I'll, these slides will be available to everyone afterwards, so um, you can refer that in your own time. And it goes back to execution. So execution is essentially, um, so yes. How are you combining that problem with you wanting to test and wanting to roll out MVP really fast? Yeah, so I guess when, when, when I talk about tests at the instance, um, I, I'm not even talking about testing for uh, and building an MVP. So the MVP stage actually happens in execute. So testing is really looking at viability at this point. So feasibility and viability. So, okay, we think that this partner and this product has potential. Um, we like a lot of things about them. We think that potentially it will fare well with our customers, but we don't know for sure. Uh, we don't even want to write MVP that yet. It's good MVP um, is actually so. When people think about MVP, um, people think that uh, it, it can be built within, you know, two weeks or three weeks. So that's never the case. Um, there's this tends to be a lot of upfront work from that discovery, etc. So um, we don't even want to kind of dive into uh, kind of investing dedicated teams to kind of, uh, of so for my team for instance i have uh, i have eight engineers i don't want to i don't want eight engineers who focus on building an mvp um, that might just get scrapped so the testing phase is you might not even uh, it might not even be be an actual app build that goes out to customer it could be just a web prototype to test with customer it could be like you know surveys it could be paper prototype it could be um, it could be uh, using uh, something similar. So any, any sort of uh, quick and dirty way to test, um, we, 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 we try to do that. So to give an example, um, back at Barclay, we had something called a Launchpad app. Instead of building in the actual functionality uh, in terms of coding it, we, uh, there's a way for, for us to sort of mimic it using design. So it's, all like, it's essentially a design prototype that's put into the app. So you could basically play around with it, but it's not actually uh, creating using code. So it's a lot faster to do it that way compared to um, actually uh, actually writing code and managing it. Yes. So would uh, this test on phase, would Design Sprint be a good uh, candidate for this? A Design Sprint, yes, exactly, yes. So um, for for those that, are, that don't know what Design Sprint is, so Design Sprint is actually um, something that's kind of popularized by Google, the way they sort of approach problems. Um, you sort of, uh, have like a week, which we call a sprint, because you're trying to get from like zero to to 100 and, and solving potentially solving a big part of the problem by the end of the week. So you start off with day one, in terms of you you, you gather um, you, you gather your team. So it should be a sort of cross-functional team. It, it shouldn't be just like product people. It should be like engineers. It should be some designers, people from different background that that could help like inspire conversation uh, and foster sort of like new ideas in the group. Um, day one, you sort of define, okay, what are the big sort of business problems or customer problems that we're facing? Frame that very nicely, um, get people to share data, get people to share sort of customer feedback to, to sort of uh, highlight, you know, what, what, what the problem is so everyone is on the same page and, and say, okay, this week did, we are trying to tackle this problem. Um, and next, you might have people, uh, you, you might ask the group to find 
good sort of ideas and, and inspiration from other brands or other apps. So you might take best practices from, from uh, I don't know, uh, WhatsApp, from Facebook Messenger, from uh, another app that you guys might use, say, say Instagram, for instance, uh, if you're looking to kind of solve a problem around, say, social, uh, if your company is a social media app and you're trying to solve a social media uh, product problem, then you might take the inspiration of those guys. Um, and then as a team, you sort of um, bring in the, the, these uh, examples and quickly have it run through to say, okay, I like the way Instagram has done this. I like the way Facebook has done this or WhatsApp has done this um, because of X, Y, Z. So everyone has, has understand the problem, everyone understand potentially the way things are done uh, elsewhere. Um, and that's when people get together and start to be creative and start drawing solutions. So start sketching uh, what we call Crazy Eight. So you have a little storyboard and, and we're, we're getting literally everyone from like engineers, designers, product people to like regular people that has no sort of like design expertise to start sketching out what the flow could potentially look like. Next, so this all happens, this don't all happen in a day, it gets spread like, throughout the week. Uh, next, what happens is um, once there's all like problem uh, and flows have been designed, we put it up into in, into wall and we we get people to vote on aspects of the designs that they like. So um, because people come from different backgrounds, have different ideas, there'll be um, at, as a whole the design might not work well, but there may be specific components functionality that works extremely well, or people like the particular idea. So we basically have like a dot voting exercise where uh, people get uh, sort of uh, sticky dots and and put dots on the, the, the parts of the, the screens that they like the most. Um, after that, we sort of like summarize it and, and everyone kind of talks about you know, what they like about the design, what they don't like about the designs. Uh, we always have a designer in room and uh, it should be a very uh, experienced designer. Designer basically amalgamates all that information. He's been, been there with us throughout the whole sprint. He's contributing as well. He sees, you know, these are the ideas uh, that people have come up with to address these problems. That these are the ones that people, we have all sort of mutually agreed on. Um, that's when the designer would then spend a lot of time to kind of thrash out a prototype within one day, literally. Uh, on the, basically at the end of the sprint, probably on a Friday, um, that's when uh, we invite customers in and test this prototype with them. So all this happened from defining a problem, come up with a solution as a group using a number of different like, methods and tools um, to testing with users on a Friday. Um, that all happens within uh, a, a week. So that's, that's essentially a design sprint. Um, Sorry, I went on a little detail there, but I think it was quite useful for people to know. So yeah, so finally, um, just going back to the execution. So once you sort of test it very quickly, um, we go into sort of, sort of the execution phase. So that is um, what I mentioned earlier about agile product management. Um, we tested it, we got good feedback. Um, the data kind of points out to that uh, customers would want, want this thing that, uh, this partnership, um, that's when we saw work for our partner to agree the commercial and scope. A lot of that should have been discussed back in the earlier phase or what that sort of commercial agreement looks like, but it should be definitely finalized before we execute. Uh, and once it's sort of finalized, we go through the sort of agile product development process to quickly build, iterate, test, et cetera, uh, and, and quickly roll out the MVP and, and build upon that as well. Cool. So, yeah, so... Thank you, everyone. So that's, that's the end of my, my speech. I hope you found it useful. driven innovation okay be careful with using the term outcome driven, driven innovation it is a systematic process which has patented elements it was it's been created by Tony Orwick and his company strategy in, in, in the States um, it, is, it, it is a systematic process for identifying user needs and uh, prioritizing them okay it, it's not just a random collection of stuff it is really seriously thought through and it, and it can take you to a place where you know every single one of your customers' needs before you even start working in the technical space. Yep, thank you. Cool. Uh, thanks, Pandit, it's really useful. So, uh, so now you're working at Startup, but previously you were pretty down at big corporations. So yes. What do you feel the difference between working as, you know, as a digital program manager in a big corporation and a startup? Maybe they're more like enhanced risk control or multiple reporting lines. Yeah. Maybe some pros and cons of 
Cool. So I'll, I'll talk you through. So it's quite a stark contrast from Barclays to Money. So I think um, there's pros and cons to to both. So the, the control and governance framework in Barclays is very strong. There's there's obviously a lot of stakeholders to manage. There are risks to manage with, um, you know, a bank with um, that, that's been around for more more than one, more than 100 years and over 10 million active customers. So um, that's one thing to bear in mind when you compare it to the. Uh, the share size of Barclays compared to any of those sort of digital challenger banks. So um, there's a lot of more, uh, I guess, discussions required stakeholders that ultimately what we call approval and sign off. That's that's required. So that's number one. Um, I think the second part is um, at a startup, um, things generally move well. I, I can't speak for all startups, but for money, so things have been moving a lot, lot faster than. Uh, I, I would ever imagine back working at Barclays um, simply because um, as a sort of product leader, you're accountable for everything from, say, profit and loss to um, risk management. So you don't, you don't necessarily have somebody uh, that provides approval for you to for a product go live. Uh, you, you, you being accountable, you should know that these risks and legal implications need to be managed, but nobody's going to tell you no, etc. Whereas in Barclays, there will be someone telling you, no, you can't go live because of X, Y, Z. Um, I think the first thing that to a benefit of, of, of Barclays is I, I, I felt like the strategic, uh, part of the kind of strategic vision and also um, understanding commercial viability was a lot stronger in Barclays and, and rightfully so being a, a, be, being a kind of traditional bank um, they care a lot about um, profit, uh, profit loss, uh, they care about you know metrics etc. Um, so I felt like that sort of um, commercial viability part was stronger back working at Barclays. Uh, not to say we don't have it in Moniz, but um, that, that's, that's, that's a one of the kind of pros about Barclays. And I think the, the other thing about startup, aside from you know, the, the great culture sometimes it has, is um, there's a lot of ep- empowerment with the team. So back at Barclays, I, had, I was leading a number of different development teams. Some of them was uh, distributed. So some, some team was based in uh, Manchester, some team was based in India, we did have a few sort of engineers and designers were based in London, but it was uh, generally quite distributed. Um, uh, from experience, so communication is a lot easier when you're all in the same office. And the way we build product teams in Monizis is, is uh, co-located, dedicated. So everyone's sitting together. You're dedicated to work on one specific product, um, I, 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 which lets you go into a lot of depth with one product. Whereas back in Barclays, you sort of like they we, we try to do dedicated teams. But what tends to happen is once you sort of build a sort of really important feature. Um, you then um, another another team that's, that has an important feature up high in the priority uh, might then t- kind of take some of the resources and and, and start um, uh, from the team, so it no longer becomes dedicated. And the far, final thing is um, empowerment. So um, back in Barclays, um, I, I did line management with a few product product managers, um, but but it, it generally it's pro- product people um, would sort of uh, be responsible for for coaching and managing uh, product people. Uh, the sort of that team manager aspect of being a product owner, product manager, um, it's, it's more uh, kind of coordination, planning, and, and getting everyone together and, and making sure things are kind of built on time. Whereas in Monet, it's quite different in the sense that um, I'm essentially the line manager for all the engineers and designers um, and, 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 and tests, for instance. So uh, in terms of setting objectives, in terms of career progression with them, in terms of um, so back to, to that's why I'm referring back to if you remember at the start of product management for product leadership, um, you're not just simply managing a team, you're looking at how you build a high performing team, how you attract the right people, retain the right people, how you help them become successful. Um, and, and ultimately your, your, your team are not just uh, engineers or your team are not just designers, they are very, very much um, uh, important in the sort of product decision making process like I am. Um, so they all kind of contribute to our ideas. And um, to, to give an example, uh, one of my designers, um, uh, so one of my engineer, uh, Maris, for instance, uh, he, he's an iOS designer, um, but has a very good eye for products. Um, one of the things that we brought into Sprint didn't quite make sense. Um, back at Barclays, uh, usually engineers are quite, uh, uh, I guess, uh, introverted in, in, in some sense, especially those that work uh, kind of remotely over in India. Um, so they, even if they kind of disagree with something, they might not kind of be vocal about it. Uh, um, engineers in, in uh, Monies are very uh, comfortable with their, a, a sharing feedback, and that's what I try to inst- instill to the team that, uh, that you know you could 
share your feedback and speak about anything at any time. Um, so um, he gave some really good feedback and highlighted some stuff that we didn't see before. So we end up um, kind of taking it out of sprint because we, we, we ultimately realized after his, his comments that uh, this wasn't the right thing to, to, to build basically. Uh, so I think that those kind of combination of like the, the team being more empowered and being uh, a true sense of those or ownership as part of being part of a dedicated team, that, that was quite different. Yep. Uh, hi. Uh, you, you mentioned briefly about prioritization. Uh, yes. I, I was quite interested to hear um, kind of the methodology or the criteria that you use to prioritize your roadmap equipmenties and how that compares to where you were to make an express and markets. Sure. So um, different companies use different sort of prioritization um, methods. So, for example, uh, there's sort of like Moscow, which is you define requirements that must have, should have, could have sort of thing. So that's, that's quite an old school way of looking at it. Um, the way I sort of prioritize anything for news stories is I, uh, you need to start with a top down vision. So you need to understand, OK, what is the so before you even get to prioritization, the vision needs to be there. You need to understand where you're taking a product in two years time, three years time, um, even five years time. Um, we might not get there in five years time, but at least you, you have a sort of goal to sort of strive for. Uh, we use this framework here at Moniz called OKRs. For those who don't know, um, OKR was kind of popularized at Google. It's essentially uh, you set an objective at the top and you set a number of key results. So. Um, I can't really go into like the, the um, my team objectives and key results, but essentially you, you define what the objectives are, and and to to meet these objectives, you have a number of, sort of key results that you need to um, achieve to, to meet these. Um, so sort of like once you have the strategy, of vision, you set your you set your uh, objectives, you set your key results. Um, you now sort of have a clear sort of like framed way of looking at your product. So when you think about all these sort of uh, requirements, user story, product features that you have in a backlog, um, how well does it align with your vision and strategy? How well does it align with the objectives and, 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 and um, key results? And what tends to happen with objective key results is it's it directly a byproduct of your company-wide vision and strategy. So if your company-wide vision and strategy is to grow revenue or drive user growth, um, naturally the OKR and, and, vision, um, and, uh, and vision and strategy that you create for your team should align with uh, with the company strategy, for example, if I'm doing um, global payments, for instance, global payments should be uh, the feature that I should prioritize should, should be uh, my objective should be growing the usage of, of people sending global payments or it should be trying to use global payments as a mean to attract new customers. So anything that any sort of features or ideas that supports this um, would probably be ranked high in my prioritization list. So just 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 a sort of really simplified way of, kind of, kind of approaching it. So considering the like how crowded the fintech space is getting and also with open banking, how does Moniz drive innovation? How do you as a product lead drive innovation in this? Yeah, so um back to like a lot of the things I I, I mentioned uh, earlier. So um I think there's um understandings are sort of like um so you need to find a sort of unique selling point. So as you rightfully mentioned, um, the space is getting quite crowded for digital banking. Um, Monza and Starling are roughly going for similar customers. Um, so tech millennials, people are you know quite quite savvy. People like you and I, um, they they are Monza is just solely kind of focused on the UK market now, but they are trying to expand, for instance, and they've been focusing on, on the UK market for a very long time. Um, we try to. Initially, our big segment was serving um, mobile, custom, um, mo mobile customers. So think about uh, uh, customers who have a relationship with multiple, um, multiple countries. So you may have to have migrated from, say, France to UK, or you have, a, um, you have ambition to move from the like, UK to like, San Francisco to work. Um, the, the idea is um, sort of like seamless sort of localization. So um, one, you have a banking account in UK. Um, if you want to move to like, San Francisco one day, um, that whole sort of like provision process of getting a bank account will be done within like seconds. So you go, you literally decide, okay, I want to go to uh, US to work, and that account will be provisioned for you. So it, it really, um, we're looking to, um, I guess, um, focus on that problem more. So sort of like mobile workers, um, mobile people, and and they they and also um, I mentioned Go Payments be my remit. So sending money, for instance. So Monster, for instance. Um, 
that their focus isn't really on international payment. Their focus hasn't really been on um, international uh, much at all, really. Um, we, uh, because of our cohort and customers um, that, that we serve, um, a lot of sort of like uh, migrant workers or people with aspiration and ties with many, many different countries, uh, remittances and sending money abroad is a big thing. So that would be a sort of an area uh, that we try to innovate and differentiate from other people. Um, and yeah, in terms of like, uh, in terms of like new ideas and all that stuff, um, obviously um, it comes down to uh, you always got to be, um, you understand that what's going on in the market, you need to uh, be, be, be very close to you know, what happens in the startup world, what, what, what your competitors are doing, what new players are doing in other industry, partnership a big one. Um, I think most of the digital bank operate in this, this sort of like marketplace partnership model. So um, no surprise, um, Monis is the same. So we have a few sort of like proprietary partnerships. So. Avios, for instance, was a strategic investor in last round Series B. Um, we are the only bank to um, have a sort of strategic partner with Avios. Um, the digital banks have a strategic partnership with Avios, for instance. So these are the sort of like areas. So focusing on the right pitch segment, um, you know, product leads need to really have foresight and show full leadership in, in identify pockets of opportunity. And the third thing is um, kind of building out to these sort of like uh, proprietary and global partnership to kind of foster trust. I think um, that, that, that that's how we kind of approach innovation. Cool. Any questions? Yeah. So how do you always split between doing the kind of the forward-looking piece and sort of doing the kind of new product discovery, doing the kind of the, the sort of innovation, uh, like identifying, screening, kind of opportunities, kind of like running design sprints, and sort of and how much of it is, is actually kind of doing execution, sort of just maintaining like because obviously you must have like a product backlog, right? So kind of just sort of things that you can have, your, 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 your dev team needs to, kind of, needs to build and sort of, yep. like, do, you, do you do you also have like a scrum master role to, kind of, like, to maintain that kind of ongoing execution on like, and what do you kind of, or is it kind of, I mean, how much do you get? Yeah, yeah, so that's a really good question. So we did have a scrum master role back at Amex and at Barclays. Um, how, we don't have a scrum master role here um, at Molly, so essentially I am doing the sort of duty of a scrum master, but what I try to, so in terms of that facilitating uh, stand-ups or if it's in a retro, so these are all sort of um, important, I guess, at ceremonies or meetings that you need to be in as part of um, sort of agile product development. So I, I essentially take on a role as Scrum Master, but what I try to do is I try to empower my team to help to sort of dedicate some of that to my team. So for instance, I was running the Sprint Retro um, last week. Now, um, uh, after running the sprint retro, um, I, I basically asked for the team uh, who wants to kind of volunteer to run the next, next sprint retro. And really, the sprint retro is working with the team to understand, um, okay, to, to basically create a list of what went well during the sprint and what didn't go well during the sprint. And, and we need to discuss it. We need to vote on the, vote on the most high priority items and we need to come up with a clear uh, plan of action on how we sort of um, avoid these issues. So we keep doing what we're doing well, but what, what's the plan of action to avoid the things that, that are not working so well? Um, so these things are really, it, it's a team thing. It's, it doesn't even necessarily need to sit within me myself. Um, so where possible, you know, I try to empower my team to try to share that responsibility um, uh, across you know, uh, one another. So back to the question about how much kind of forward thinking thing that I do, I try to block out uh, time in my calendar. So obviously, uh, meeting with um, new startup, attending events, um, looking at sort of industry reports, um, also just uh, t taking a, like, immense sort of curiosity in like, what goes on around you, that sort of thing. Uh, thinking time, um, trying to, back to what I mentioned about first principle thinking, it's not, it's not simply just looking at um, what, what are these like, fintechs are doing, because um, if you're trying to like, copy someone, um, you're always up one step behind, so you're, you're, you're really trying to amalgamate like good inspiration and ideas from all different industry and creative apply it to your own industry. Um, so that's something that I specifically block at time to do um, on a regular basis. Um, so I guess 30% um, 30, 30 of that would be kind of strategic, 40% uh, of the strategic uh, and execution still needs to be done, but with the empowered team, it gets a lot easier. Uh, we also have um, someone like a, I have a product analyst in the team who uh, really supports on a lot of the kind of operational stuff from uh, run, uh, running, kind of helping with user research, gathering data insights and making recommendations. So that's all um, offloads some of my uh, kind of duties um, from the operational side as well. So that's great. Cool.